All right, so 1 Samuel chapter number 3, if you have a Bible. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, but you would like one, um, James is in the back. He's going to walk across the back, and if you slip up your hand, he'll give you one. If you don't own a Bible, we'd love to uh, let you take one home with you, or if that one doesn't meet your needs, they may be a little worn out or small print, we can get you one that fits your needs because we feel there's nothing better that you could uh, leave with than having the Word of God in your hands, all right? So 1 Samuel chapter number 3. And typically uh, in this series, we've been taking a few minutes to have some group discussion. Uh, we're going to forego that this morning um, just because uh, I just feel like we'll, i got a lot to get through and uh, I don't want you to be here until 3 o'clock this afternoon. So uh, just kidding. We don't have that much to get through. But we do want to make sure we finish uh, the sermon that we started last week. All right. How many of you for this time of year is a busy time of year? Anybody in the fall, a really busy time of year for some of you? Okay, a few of you. Anybody else? Anybody need a Bible change that's coming through? All right, let me see that again. I think some of you are being dishonest with me. How many of you would say that fall is a busy time of year? Yes, all right, there we go. I see a few more hands. I know for me, it's insanely busy. All right, fall is just crazy. Um, whether it's a kid started school or, um, you know, just different things going on here at church. You know, I know for our family, our whole routine and schedule has changed over the last couple months. And then also kind of, uh, I don't know if you call it a side hustle, but uh, I referee soccer games on the side as well. I see South Kent shirts. I was at South Kent on Friday and uh, other schools, I officiate uh, soccer games. And yesterday, it's a public school, it's a playoff game. And so yesterday I was uh, over in Bethel doing a playoff game and uh, it kind of, I think it was at halftime, I'm standing there and I'm kind of walking to midfield because uh, I was in the center and I look up and I'm like, wow, that is a crowd full of people. And it was kind of like in that moment you're thinking like, wow, like if I do something like wrong, you know, there's a lot of people that are not going to be very happy with me. I mean, this is all process things I processed before. I mean, I've been doing this for 17 years, but it was like yesterday in that moment, I'm like, wow, like there's a lot of people. It's a playoff game. Things are on the line and all that kind of stuff. But the thing I love about playoffs is not only is the intensity ratcheted up because if you lose, you're done, but you tend to see the stadiums more full and things like that. But it's also a whole lot more pressure, and so it's like one of those things as an official, it's like, man, you better be on your game today because the last thing you want is to meet some unhappy parents on the way to your car after a game and uh, hear about how poor of a job you did. And so you know as an official, yeah, you're always going to make somebody unhappy. Every time you blow the whistle, there's about half the stands and half the players that are going to be upset, and the other half are going to be trapping and cheering, right? But I notice, as an official, um, that it can get really loud at some of these stadiums. And it's interesting that no matter how loud it typically gets, most of the time, as an official, when I blow the whistle, players stop, no matter how loud it is, because their ears are attuned to listening for that whistle, right? Now, in the stands, they'll carry on their conversation. They'll keep, you know, you know, talking and cheering and whatever. And they kind of maybe don't acknowledge the whistle. They kind of see play stopping, but they don't really acknowledge it the way the players do. But the players, no matter how loud and crazy it gets, no matter how much their coach may be screaming at them, most of the time, you blow the whistle as an official and they stop because their ears are tuned to listening for that whistle because they know that means we have to stop and we have to do something different because there's been a foul. It's been called, right? And so I was thinking about this last night, and I thought that's a lot how it is with the voice of God in many ways. For many of us, we are attuned to God's voice. And the moment he speaks, we are ready to listen and hear and step to obey whatever it is. But there's some of us, like those people in the stands at a soccer game or whatever sport, you just got to go on with everyday life, not even acknowledging that God may be trying to speak. Not even acknowledging that something's going on and God's trying to get my attention and I don't even realize it. And so I thought it was an interesting analogy because that's what we're talking about today. If you've not been with us, um, I want you to see that we are in the middle of a series right now in call, it's called Experiencing God. It comes from a Bible study we did this summer with the same title by Henry Blackaby. And in this study, it talked about knowing and doing the will of God. And, and today we're talking about the fourth of seven realities that Blackaby lays out in the study about how we can know God's will and how we can 
do God's will. And so just as a way of review, especially for those of you who may not have been with us, this is a diagram of those seven realities. You can see God up there in the cloud and that big arrow going over um, to your right is God's work, all right? And so the first reality was that God is always at work around you. And we talked about how God is always working around us. We may not see it. We may not pause long enough to recognize it. We may not, you know, stop, as they say, and smell the roses, but the truth of the matter is that God is always at work around us, all right? He is not a God who just sits there and just kind of observes. No, he is always at work around us. And so that's the first reality we talk about. And then the second one is that God pursues a continuing relationship with us that is real and personal. So if God is always at work around us and he's inviting us to join him in his work, it's important that we are in the kind of relationship that's going to be able to recognize how he's working, right? It's all about our relationship with God. That is the key to all of this. Because God is pursuing a relationship with you that's real, that's vibrant, that's personal. And if you don't have that kind of relationship, you're not going to be able to see how God is working around you. And then you're not going to be able to join him then in that work. And so that's the third reality, that God invites you to become involved with him in his work. And so we're seeing kind of these realities in this diagram playing out. Which then brings us to reality number four, which we started the last time we were together. Remember last week we had a chili cook-off and a testimony, and so we took a pause from the series last week. But two weeks ago we talked about reality number four, and that is this, that God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. And I know that's a lot to chew on, and so we've kind of divided it up into two weeks. And so look with me, if you will, in 1 Samuel chapter 3, because this was kind of our springboard text as we read the scripture together. And I believe I have it up here on the screen for us. There we go. 1 Samuel chapter 3. I'm going to read the first 14 verses. But if you don't know anything about Samuel, let me just give you a little bit of perspective. Samuel's mother, Hannah, desperately wanted a child, and she was barren. And she was just praying and crying out to God that God would give her a son. And she promised God that, God, if you give me a son, I will dedicate him back to you and he will serve you in the temple. And so God answers her prayers and opens up her womb and he, she has a child and his name is Samuel. And after raising him for a time, she then takes him to the temple where he is going to live and he is going to serve there in the temple under the high priest at that time who was known as Eli. Eli wasn't the best high priest. He had some sons who were pretty wicked, all right, and pretty evil and weren't really holding the responsibilities as they should have as priests there in the temple. But here we see for the first time God speaking to Samuel. So look with me in verse number one. Again, we started with this last week, but this is going to be our springboard as we talk about this fourth reality. And the Bible says this. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare. In those days, there was no frequent vision. Isn't that sad, that statement? That the word of the Lord was rare in those days. I pray that for each of us, the word of the Lord isn't rare in our lives. That the word of the Lord isn't rare in our everyday interactions, in our everyday situations of life. There was no frequent vision. And at the time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim, so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel and said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went to lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Verse number 8. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel, at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. 
On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Interesting statement there. Father and his children and how the father is being held responsible here for how he's not restraining his children. Verse 14, Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. And so in this message we've simply entitled, Can You Hear It? We are looking at this reality of the fact that God speaks. He speaks by the Holy Spirit in a variety of different ways and for a variety of different reasons, and that's what we're going to talk about here today. We began last time by looking at uh, point number one, which was the reality of God's voice. And in that discussion, we talked about how all throughout Scripture, God has been speaking to his people. From Genesis all the way to the New Testament, and then we saw it in Jesus being God in the flesh is speaking, and then he's continuing to speak through um, you know, Paul and some of the other apostles. And even so today, God continues to speak to his people because God is a relational God. He wants a relationship with his people, and so God uh, speaks. Because in the relationship, there needs to be communication. And so God, all throughout Scripture, for all times, has always spoken to his people. That's the reality of God's voice. Now, you may not recognize it. It may not be a voice you tend to hearing. I use the analogy. Um, if you've had little kids or you've had a baby, you know the cry of your baby, right? You could put your baby in a nursery and it could be a bunch of other babies, a bunch of other cries. And your ear is attuned as a mother to the cry of your baby. Any other random person might walk by and just have no idea who's crying in there. But you as a mother, because you're so attuned to that cry, know that it's your baby. And so that's the idea here. God is speaking to his people. God wants a relationship with us. But the question is, are we hearing God's voice? So that was the reality of God's voice is that he has always been and always has been speaking to his people. Then we looked at the revelation of God's voice, or at least we started to. We talked about this idea that God speaks through uh, the Holy Spirit or by the Holy Spirit through a variety of different mediums. And so we talked about who the Holy Spirit was and some of the roles the Holy Spirit has in our lives. Because Jesus said when he left uh, his disciples, he said, one greater than I is coming. And if I don't go, he will not be able to come. And so while the disciples had Jesus walking with them, we have God living in us, which is far greater and so we need to understand the power that we have in having the Holy Spirit. When we enter into a relationship with Jesus, one of the greatest blessings we receive is the Holy Spirit in our lives. There to guide us and direct us and help us and strengthen us and empower us. And the list goes on and on in the, the different roles of the Holy Spirit. And so we looked at that last time. So if you missed it, make sure you go back and watch it on YouTube because we talked a lot about the Holy Spirit and how he works in our lives. So God speaks to us today uh, by the Holy Spirit through a variety of different ways. And we talked about that one of the main ways, the primary ways that God speaks is he speaks to us through the Bible, right? He's given us his word written down for us that has been preserved throughout the generation so that you and I can know what God is trying to say to his people. So do you want to know what God is saying to you? Do you want to hear God's voice? We'll start by opening up the pages of Scripture and begin reading the pages of Scripture because in here is contained the Word of God. All right? And so one of the primary ways that God speaks by the Holy Spirit is through His Word. And so we must develop this love for the Scriptures so that we can be attuned to God's voice speaking to us. But there's other ways that the Holy Spirit speaks to us, not just through the Bible. Now, again, that's a primary way. Remember we talked about if any of these other ways contradict the Bible, right, then we're missing something on the other side, right? Because God's voice is never going to contradict his word because he has given us his word. It is true. And so if you have an experience or a circumstance or some other thing, a dream that goes contrary to God's word, trust me, it's not God speaking to you because he's never going to go against what he's given us in his word. So he speaks through the spirit, by the spirit, through the word. But another way he speaks is through prayer. I love what Andy Murray said. He said this, Prayer is not monologue, but dialogue. God's voice is, most essential, is the most essential part. 
Listening to God's voice is a secret of the assurance that he will listen to mine. So again, prayer is not a monologue. It's a dialogue. It's a chance for you and I to listen and have conversation with God. It's not just about us talking to God, but prayer is about us learning to listen. That should cause us to pause and maybe ask ourselves the question, when I go to God in prayer, if I'm going to God in prayer, right? That's the first step. But when I go to God in prayer, is it mostly me talking or does it involve some of me listening? Because if it doesn't involve you listening, I promise you, if you incorporate just a listening heart into your prayer life, you're going to be amazed at just how God can speak into the stillness of a heart that is listening and waiting for God to speak. You see, because oftentimes we have kind of this misrepresentation or this, this misunderstanding of what prayer is. We think it's just us talking to God and us giving God a list of requests that we want him to do. And we uh, miss a huge depth in what prayer is truly meant to be. Because really, prayer is just about listening as much as it is about talking. Yes, God wants his children to come to him in prayer, but he also wants us to listen as we pray. He wants us to be in his word, but he wants us to listen. Psalm 145, verse 18 says this, The Lord is near to all who call on him. To all who call on him in truth. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, First Thessalonians, did I miss Jeremiah 33, 3? No, I didn't put it in. All right. First Thessalonians 5, 17 says, Pray without ceasing. And all throughout scripture, you can find verses that talk about God's desire for his people to come to him in prayer. And he commands us to pray. All throughout the day to pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean that we, you know, just sit down and we neglect everything else and we just sit in silence and we pray. Oh, no, but it's an attitude of prayer, an attitude of open communication. I heard somebody say it like this. When you wake up in the morning, you say, hi, God. And when you go to bed at night, you say, all right, good night, God. And all throughout the day, there's an open conversation that you are having with God. You're in that posture of prayer, understanding that you are in the presence of God. And so that is the idea of prayer. It's not just about me talking and communicating and laying out a laundry list of requests that I have for God, but it's an idea that I am actually coming to God in conversation, in dialogue, and I'm also listening as he speaks. Because oftentimes we just take prayer and say, okay, I'm going to pray for this list of things and all these things I want God to do, and we miss just the depth and the intimacy that is meant to be a part of prayer. Because in reality, prayer is really about three things. So I encourage you maybe write this down. Three primary things about prayer. One is just acknowledging God's character. When you go to God in prayer, you're acknowledging his character. You're praising him for who he is. Just all of his attributes, his character. You're coming to God, understanding that you are nothing and he is everything. And so you are acknowledging his character. That's one aspect of prayer. Another thing about prayer is that you are aligning your desires with his desires. So you're acknowledging his character. You're aligning to his desires. You're saying, God, I might want to do this. So this is what I have planned. or this is what I'm dreaming for my life. But align those things with you and your will and what you want for me. Right? A famous verse in the Bible that's often taken out of context is delight in the Lord. and He will give you the desires of your heart. We're like, all right, if I'll just delight in the Lord and do all this, he's going to give me everything I want. But the reality is, when you look and see what it means to delight, what you are doing is you are truly delighting in God, so much so that what he desires becomes what you desire. And so he's naturally going to give you the desires of your heart because it's his desires that he's placed there. And so we need to understand that part of us going to God in prayer is us aligning our desires to his. So it's about acknowledging his character. It's about aligning to his desires. It's about advancing our relationship or growing in our relationship. I use advancing because it's A and it's, you know, now they're all A's, but, you know, but growing in your relationship, advancing in your relationship. Part of prayer is just a way that you and I can grow closer to God. We can advance in our relationship with him and draw nearer to him and get to know him more deeply and more intimately. Does that make sense? Yes. But yet oftentimes what we do is we just view prayer as this one-way conversation where we give all our requests to God and say, okay, this is what I want you to do, God. Amen. And then we go on with our day and kind of never take any more thought of the conversation that God's longing to have for us. 
following me? You drag with me? I see some blanks there. Yeah, you're good? All right, good. So prayer is kind of one of these things that we often misunderstand, but if we want to know and do God's will and we want to hear God's voice, we need to understand the depth that there is in prayer. Because oftentimes, I will God speak to us through his word, but many times when we put his word together with prayer, there's just a great way that God can speak to our hearts. So he speaks through prayer. The Holy Spirit also speaks through the Bible. But another way the Holy Spirit often speaks to our heart and God speaks to us is through circumstances. Right? Through things we go through in our life, through experiences that we have. We must understand, we must remember that nothing we go through ever catches God by surprise. Isn't that good to know? That even in your deepest, darkest, most surprising moment, nothing catches God by surprise. As you look back in your life and see that horrible tragedy you had to deal with, God wasn't surprised when it happened. And maybe now that you're on the other end of it, you start to see some of what God was doing. Maybe you'll never fully understand what God was doing. But can I tell you, there was a purpose and a plan in what it was because it never caught God by surprise. If you look back in the book of Job, right? Job wants to basically come after, or Satan wants to come after Job, but what does he have to do first? He goes to God and says, have you considered your servant Job? Basically, can I have permission to attack Job? You've put this hedge about him, and he's got everything going good in his life. Watch me go to work in his life and see if he doesn't curse you. And God gives Satan permission and says, you can do whatever, just don't take his life, right? So even in that horrible attack that he experienced at the hand of the enemy, it first had to go through his heavenly father. And so we need to understand that the circumstances and experiences we face in life are often ways that God is using to communicate to us and to speak to us. Because life can be hard, but sometimes it's in those hard moments that God often has our best attention, right? Sometimes it's in those most challenging and difficult situations that we're more attuned to God's voice than when things are going really good. And so sometimes God speaks to us through the circumstances of life. And so when it comes to our circumstances, there are a couple things we need to remember. First of all, is that God works in an orderly fashion. The Bible says that God is a God of decency, is a God of order and not chaos. And one of the things I really got that was interesting in the study as we did it this summer was kind of this idea, this, the, this thought that God works in an orderly fashion. And what they talked about is that we should make kind of a... Um, milestones or uh, markers in our spiritual life. In the same way that when the Israelites crossed over the Jordan River, if you remember the story in the Old Testament, what did they do? They took 12 stones and they kind of built an altar, a memorial there saying, hey, when your kids look at this, tell them this is what God did. A reminder. And one of the things they challenged us to do in the study was to think back in our lives and kind of jot down some of the things you've seen God do. And as you look back in your past and you see how God has worked, you can see that there's an order to what God has been doing. Because he's a God who is a God of order, not chaos. He's not going to take you here and then here and then here and then here and all. No, everything is working together for God's purposes. Everything is working in an orderly fashion. It might seem chaotic to you. And you might say, I have no idea why this is related to this. And, but if you take a step back and begin to jot, okay, God, I saw you do this back then. And you begin to look, it's like, oh, God is doing something here. He's preparing me for something. He's working in my heart. And so that's one of the things we need to understand about our circumstances. I know sometimes we don't like to go through the things we go through. But remember, in the midst of it, God is working. And he is doing a great work in the midst of that. He has a purpose and the circumstances that you are called to endure. And so understand, in the midst of those things, another thing we need to remember is that we need to try to gain his perspective in the midst of those things. Because when you're in the middle of the storm, it's hard for you to know which way is up, right? When you're in the middle of the storm, it's hard to understand, okay, God, what are you doing? But what we need to try to do is simply get ourselves to a place where we can see things from God's perspective and say, okay, God, I don't understand it all, but I can see that you're at work here. So help me to adopt your perspective as I endure this difficult situation. And so we need to understand as we are in the middle of the storm, God is above the storm looking at it. And he has it under control. And so we need to try to adopt his perspective. So God speaks through circumstances. He speaks through prayer. He speaks through the Bible. 
he speaks through the church. Now, when I say the church, I'm not saying like the walls of this building speak to you when you come here. Okay, the church represents the people, right? We are the church. We are the body of Christ, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, there are varieties of gifts with the same spirit, and there are varieties of service with the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common Good. And I love this picture that God gives us of the church in the New Testament, the picture of the body. You might be an arm or a leg or a nose hair or a kidney, but your job is important. You have a role to play. And if you don't do your job and you don't carry forth your responsibility, then we all suffer, right? You know what it's like to stub your pinky toe? Your pinky toe isn't very significant until you stub it on the wall. And then your whole body hurts, right? That's the idea here. We need one another. And a lot of times when we gather together, we gather together to encourage one another, to build one another up. And sometimes God can use somebody in this room and something they say to speak to your heart, right? Now, sometimes it might be a message you hear me preach. But other times it might be a conversation you have with somebody. Can I tell you, sometimes kids can teach you the most valuable lessons about God that you won't learn anywhere else. An innocent comment by a child can often be God speaking because it pricks your heart in a certain way. Anybody ever been there? If you've been around little kids, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So God uses the church to speak to our lives many times. I love what Henry Blackaby said. He said this, God can use the words of a teenager, the prayer of a senior citizen, or the candid remark of a child to convict you of the need to make changes in your life. And when that happens, it is simply God speaking through that person directly to your heart. And so again, this is not an exhaustive list of all the only ways that God speaks. I know I've heard some people who have had God speak to them maybe in a dream or a variety of different ways. But understand, primary ways we see God work are through circular, God speak are through the church and, and other spiritual people in our lives, through circumstances that we go through, through prayer and through his word. And, 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 and just understand, these are all ways that God reveals his self to us. This is the revelation of God's voice, which then brings us to point number three, which are the reasons for God's voice. So we looked at the reality that is that God is longing to speak to our hearts. He's been speaking since the beginning of time. He continues to speak today. The question is, is he speaking to you? Are you hearing his voice as he speaks? Then we looked at the revelation of God's voice. How is it that he speaks? Well, he speaks by the Holy Spirit through a variety of different methods. Prayer, the Bible, circumstances, um, the church, other ways. But now, why does God speak? So what is the reason for God's voice? Why does he speak to us? Okay, if he longs to do it and he does it in a variety of different methods, why does he do it? Well, understand, when God speaks, he is not speaking just for the sake of speaking. Right? God's not speaking just to hear his own voice. He's speaking for a purpose. When God speaks, he is typically speaking for one of three reasons. He's speaking to reveal himself and who he is. He's speaking to reveal his purposes or he's just speaking to reveal his ways and how it is he's working in certain situations. Here in 1 Samuel chapter 3, where we began today, notice what it says in verse 11 through 13. If you have it in front of you, the Bible says this, Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel, at which the ear, two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God and did not restrain them. He did not restrain them. So God is speaking to Samuel, letting him know what he is about to do, right? Revealing to Samuel his purposes and what is about to take place. In Exodus chapter 3, verse number 6, you see God appearing to Moses in a burning bush. And notice what he says. It's um, up here on the screen. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. 
And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look to God. So before he's even going to reveal his purposes for Moses and how he wants to use Moses, what does he reveal to Moses? Who he is. And who it is that's speaking to him. And sometimes when we hear God's voice, it's simply about God wanting to reveal something new about himself that we've forgotten or that we failed to realize. Because can I tell you, God is so much bigger that you can never fully understand the complexity of God. And no matter how deep you dive into who he is, there's still so much more you're never going to know. But oftentimes, God will speak to our heart to reveal to us an aspect of who he is, an aspect of his character, so we can draw closer to him, and we can know him in a new and a fresh way. Does that make sense? And so, God is speaking here to Moses, saying, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. This is who I am. I want you to know the God who worked in their lives that you've heard about so miraculously is the one who's speaking to you right now in this burning bush. And then he's going to go on to speak to him more about his purposes and his plans and how he wants to use Moses to deliver his people from Egypt. But again, there was a purpose for why he spoke. He didn't just appear in this burning bush to say, hey, look what I can do. (laughs) No, he appeared in the burning bush and spoke to Moses because there was a purpose behind it. He wanted to reveal to Moses who he was and what it was that he was doing. So when you are attentive to God's voice, understand the reason in which he speaks to our life is because he's trying to reveal one of those things. He's trying to reveal who he is. He's trying to get you to know him in a deeper, more intimate way. He wants you to see a part about his character that you've never seen before. Maybe he has something that he wants you to do. He wants you to join him in some aspect of his work. And he's revealing to you his purposes and his plans. And he's saying, hey, I want you to join me in this. And so those are some of the reasons why God speaks to our lives. Again, he doesn't speak just, you know, for the sake of speaking. He speaks on purpose and for a reason. And so when we hear his voice, we have to decipher, okay, God, what is it that you are saying? And how is it that I need to interpret this? What is it that I need to do? What is it that you're showing me about yourself? And then lastly, I want us to look at the response to God's voice. So we've seen the reality. God has been speaking and continues to speak to his people. We saw the revelation of God's voice. He speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, through prayer, through circumstances, through the church, through other ways. And we've seen the reasons in order to reveal his self, his purposes, his ways. And now I want us to see maybe where it can kind of all hit home is then what is our response to God's voice? What is our response to God's voice? When God speaks, how is it that I should respond And so again, I want to draw your attention to 1 Samuel chapter number 3. Because I feel here that Samuel gives us a really good picture of how it is that we should respond to God's voice. So again, in chapter 3, as we read, Samuel didn't, uh, didn't really know the voice of the Lord, right? He thought it was Eli hollering to him from another room. And he runs to Eli and says, what is it? And Eli says, why'd you wake me up? I didn't say anything. It happens three times. And then finally, Eli gets the hint. He's like, oh, well, maybe it's God speaking to you, Samuel, so do this. And sure enough, it was God. And so Samuel is now becoming familiar with God's voice. But I love the example Samuel sets for us here in this passage. Notice what it says. Eli, it says in verse 9, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And notice what Samuel does. Samuel said, speak, for your servant hears. Speak, for your servant hears. And when God's voice is speaking through our lives, we need to develop that same kind of posture, that same kind of attitude. That attitude that says, God, speak. Because your servant listens, your servant hears, and your servant is ready to do whatever it is you are asking me to do. That's the response that should be a part of God's voice speaking to our hearts. An attitude of surrender, an attitude of submission that says, God, whatever it is you're telling me, I am willing to do. Right? Which is going to bring us to reality number five. 
that's going to talk about a crisis of belief that we have a decision to make in that moment. When God speaks, we then have a decision to make. Am I willing to obey what it is that God is saying? Because most of the time when God speaks to us, he's speaking and it's going to make us a little bit uncomfortable, isn't it? It's going to make us a little bit kind of, uh, I don't know that I want to do that. It's going to go against our flesh and our natural desires and go against maybe what we want to do. But ultimately, it's going to be for our good and for his glory because it tells us in Ephesians 3 that he wants to do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever ask, think, or imagine, right? And so understand, when God speaks, that should be our response. Just like Samuel said, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Our attitude should be, all right, Lord, if you're speaking, I'm hearing, I'm listening, my ears are attentive, and I want to do whatever it is you call me to do. But in order for us to have that attitude, um, God is speaking. I didn't plan that. Is that you? Is that you, God? That was weird. I, wow. Dude, somebody's on Bluetooth over there. <laughs> Anyways, all right, that was so well-timed. I could not even plan that. So, anyways, that's not usually how God speaks, but it got our attention, didn't it? Wow. So, that's, that's, that's hilarious. But when God speaks, we need to be attentive to listening. Just like Samuel said, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. An attitude, a posture of obedience, of surrender, of submission. So that needs to be our attitude as well. Because if God is going to take the initiative to speak into our lives... Who are we to hold out our hands and say, God, I don't want to hear what you have to say. So again, this is where the rubber hits the road, right? This is where it kind of becomes a reality that we need to say, okay, do I want to obey? Am I going to do what it is that God is telling me to do? Because our response to God's voice is critical. So again, I spent a lot of time on the soccer field this time of year, and there's certain people who are more tuned to hearing that whistle than others in the stadium, right? Just like many of us sitting here, there's some of us who are more tuned to hearing God's voice maybe than others. So the question is, what is it that's keeping you from hearing God's voice? What is it that's keeping you from being attentive when he speaks into your life? Because he longs to speak. He longs for you to join him in his work. He longs for you to be a part of what he is accomplishing. And it's not an issue on his end. If you're not hearing a voice, it's an issue on your end. And so what is it that's keeping you from hearing God's voice? What is it that's keeping us from being like Samuel and say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears.